Few conflicts partaken in by the US conjure up the same infamy and debate which the Vietnam War has. In the build-up to the conflict during what was known as the First Indochina War between France and independence forces, the US had remained neutral and was in fact hesitant to involve itself. As with the onset of the Cold War, the US had adopted not only an anti-communist policy, but an anti-European imperialist policy as well. Which, in regards to Indochina and later on much of Africa, would leave the United States between a rock and a hard place. Vietnamese nationalist and communist Ho Chi Minh, leader of the independence forces, had made early appeals to the US in hopes of gaining their support against France. Meanwhile, the French were teetering closer to communism themselves, with their own communist party rising in popularity as their colonies and thus resources fractured away. It was a volatile choice between aiding a communist faction against an imperial one or the inverse. And as the former ran a risk of bringing the Soviets deeper into Western Europe, not to mention East Asia, the US moved to support the French, in small ways at first, financial and logistical support only. Officially, the US would not put troops on the ground. To quote Republican President Dwight Eisenhower, we have voted for the cheapest way to prevent the occurrence of something which would be of the most terrible significance to the United States of America. Referring to the concept of domino theory, in which the Soviets gradually expanded the communist sphere to encroach upon and eventually surround the Western nations. It's a notion which would be echoed by Democrat successors John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Baines Johnson, and to a lesser extent Republican Richard Nixon, who by that point would have been more concerned with how the loss of land would have crippled American and Western confidence while emboldening the communists. Hence his strategy of ending the war with quote, peace and honor. And although Nixon did bring the war to a close, it had in fact taken its toll upon American pride, confidence, and determination. In the end, American forces withdrew from Vietnam, leaving what remained of the fight to the disorganized South Vietnamese. Northern communist forces would soon take power in the South as well as in neighboring Cambodia and Laos, reunifying the nation as a pro-Soviet force who would shortly then after come into conflict with Chinese-backed Cambodia, or Kampuchea as it would then be known. This conflict, known as the Third Indochina War, would have been motivated by a desire for dominance in the region, historical animosities, and ideological disagreements, which itself would have torn a hole in the already shattering international communist facade. As for the US, well, like we said, trust and pride had been dealt a blow, which perhaps even today we have yet to recover from. Every military effort following having been met with tremendous scrutiny, both justified and not, and it's no stretch to say that the greatest injury dealt to America in that conflict had been a psychological and cultural one. But what if that changed? What if in an alternate timeline the US had managed to muster a victory both politically and culturally, defeating communist forces without losing public support so dramatically? Well, as it turns out, American forces were performing quite well in battle. In terms of numbers, training, resources, and weapons, the US was, of course, leagues above the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese forces. The issue came as a question of whether North or South Vietnam had a greater will to survive. North Vietnam, though it embraced collectivist and communistic ideals, was at its core a nationalistic movement which aimed at unification of its historic lands and total freedom from oppression of outside powers, including even neighboring communist China. South Vietnam, on the other hand, was an attempt by France and later the US to maintain a hold in a region which was not fully westernized and not fully colonized. Its leadership was unpopular and perceived as puppets of France or the West. The government was often seen as repressive and unrepresentative of the people, and its population, which was pro-Western, came to simply favor migration to France or the US over defending its own land. Meanwhile, others, most especially rural farmers, came to perceive the US as the real invasive occupying force and actually aligned themselves with the communists. Despite industry, infrastructure, education, and crop production booming in the region, its population lacked the same zeal and motivation of the North. Thus, why American and French intervention was so crucial to the South's continuity. It simply didn't want to exist as much as the North did. And eventually, when the US also thought it was no longer worth the effort, the Republic of South Vietnam ceased to exist. What this means is that without something seriously worth fighting for and rallying around, the only way to keep Vietnam communist free for the remainder of the Cold War would be a Middle Eastern style indefinite military occupation of some scale. Although this could very gradually be ended with a more extensive Vietnamization policy, that being the slow replacement of American soldiers in the nation with newly trained Vietnamese forces, who would additionally for this to work need a leader as charismatic and as firm on Vietnamese independence as Ho Chi Minh, but not a communist. So you can probably see this is going to be more complicated than it seems, and on top of that, this needs to be done within a specific time frame to prevent American disillusionment with the conflict, and thus a decline of efforts which led the US to withdraw itself in our world. There's two main ways to go about this, the first being to simply cut off the Ho Chi Minh Trail through Laos early on. 
The Ho Chi Minh Trail had been the covert northern invasion route used to funnel agents, weapons, and information to the south, and played a major role in the northern war effort. There had been an early request to do exactly this, to cut off the trail. However, President Johnson had denied the request to not compromise the neutrality of Laos. Had the trail been cut, the Viet Cong would have been without coordination and resources, strangling them out early on and forcing the North to either accept American presence in the South, which they wouldn't, or launch an offensive directly from their border, which would be easily defeated by justifiable retaliation. The alternative to this would be a more aggressive reaction following the Tet Offensive. This offensive had been a shocking attack upon the South carried out by the Viet Cong during the Vietnamese New Year, and was a nationwide assault on several towns and cities in hopes of sparking an uprising. What makes this event so significant is the tremendous role it played in diminishing the president's credibility, not only to the public but even within the military and government, as he had made several optimistic claims and reports just prior to what was shown by the media as a catastrophe, assuring the majority of America that the war was in fact not being won, and that some 200,000 more men would need to join the fight before it was over. Now, on the contrary to public and media reaction, this offensive had actually been a massive loss for the North, as it had depleted some 50 to 70 percent of Viet Cong forces, and may well have inspired the necessary resentment in the South to take action against the Communist North. But American bravado waned, and the anti-war movement grew. American soldiers started speaking about returning home, and what had originally been thought of as a great loss by the North was now seen as the greatest of all victories. It had successfully turned the conscience of America against its own government, a strategy which the Soviets themselves perceived early on and took generous advantage of throughout the Cold War. To quote a former Vietnamese chief of staff, America lost because of its democracy. Through dissent and protest, it lost the ability to mobilize a will to win. Let's suppose that in this world, the Tet Offensive becomes an immediate rallying call for the South Vietnamese. President Theo, who at the time had been away from the capital, allows his Vice President Ki to overshadow him as the hero of this event and take charge of the nation. In our world, the President had been perceived as a corrupt official, a reputation perhaps not too far off the mark. This was not helped by the fact that he was both a Catholic and a grossly non-Catholic nation, and his Vice President, a major rival at the time popular among the military, would ultimately be dismissed from his position. In truth, the president had been little more than a figurehead, and it was in fact Vice President Ki, along with his military committee, that held real power, or rather, got things done. By dismissing his vice president, Theo would have effectively denied South Vietnam its greatest opportunity at military strength and national unity. But in this world, things go a bit differently. The president, seeing the need to take quick action as well as recognizing the authority and capability of his second in command, decides to stand down, allowing Key to freely direct the national army as he saw fit and fire up the public against what was evident for all to see as a shared enemy which threatened them all. Thanks to better mobilization, the damage is significantly reduced in this timeline and is followed with a full scale southern retaliation. The American media would report on the incident, but instead of painting it as a northern victory which exploited a lack of preparation on the part of the US, it is instead portrayed as an underhanded attack by the North which awoke a sleeping giant. Because once again the war would appear to be favoring the US and South, public support remains high and the anti-war movement shrinks. If we assume Nixon still wins election in this timeline, his rapprochement with China and the USSR would ultimately isolate North Vietnam, putting them in a position to accept Western demands if they haven't been defeated by this point. A best guess as to when the war would end would probably be sometime between 1970 and 1973. The two halves of the country would reunite under the leadership of President Ki, himself remaining in power but allowing for new elections to be held for the appointment of ministers and representatives as a show of restoring unity in the nation while maintaining the fragile peace. The Communist Party itself would be outlawed and its most radical supporters arrested or purged, however some minor communist elements would be allowed to remain and even achieve positions of power, as Ki openly recognized that the communists were closer to the Vietnamese people's desires for social justice and independent life, this translating into a redistribution and quota program for a number of farms, but ultimately a scrapping of the ineffective land collectivization which was seen in our world. An interesting statement that's often been made about Vietnam is that despite Northern success in enduring the war, when left with the task of nation building, it dramatically fell short. The South, in contrast with its Western support, was able to begin industrialization and saw production output rise dramatically. With this in mind, it's likely the Vietnam of this world will be further along developmentally and far more prepared to tackle rival Cambodia in its consolidation of power throughout Indochina, bringing the whole of the region into the anti-communist bloc. Now, despite a firm anti-communist stance and an admiration for Western advancement, Ki would have made it a great priority to assert Vietnamese independence from both the West and East. Ki's assertion of Vietnamese sovereignty would certainly net him greater support from both the Northern and Southern populations, 
As once again beyond the label of communism or anti-communism, Vietnam at its core simply wanted to break free from the domination of larger powers. He himself even regarded the war as a shameful battle between brothers and one fueled by foreign interests. As the years wore on, the illusion of democracy being restored slowly receded and Ki would hold dictatorial power in a fashion similar to the South American dictatorships. The nation would attract American resources out of necessity for prevention of communist resurgence, resources which would be directed toward the improvement of Vietnamese living standards and make it a shining model in Southeast Asia even despite political repression by the government. For the US, a victory in Vietnam of this character would do great things for national morale and civilian government relations, greatly diminishing the level of political and social dissent among the baby boomers and reassuring the US of its containment strategies so far. American soldiers overseas would gradually be substituted for Vietnam's own revitalized army and in large part be brought home, save for a minor peacekeeping presence in the north. Despite what some might think, a victory in Vietnam, although it would reaffirm the effectiveness of containment, would not encourage more boots on the ground action in other nations to the same scale this prior war had seen. Americans would obviously recognize how devastating and costly this effort had been, and while opposition to government war efforts would have diminished, it'd be pretty obvious to everybody, most especially those in high military and governing positions, that there were better approaches to a drawn out occupation of a foreign land, choicely the backing of morally gray anti-communist groups. Covertly, of course. This had been a tactic already utilized by the US, but one which upon coming to light fell far out of favor on account of civilian distrust in the government, and would ultimately be stifled by the War Powers Resolution, Clark Amendment, and Boland Agreement, which in short reduced executive ability to order or support military action without congressional approval. Because in this world military action has proven successful but exceedingly costly, these more underhanded and secretive methods may become more appealing and accepted by the establishment, especially in cases of supporting what were perceived by some as colonial or oppressive regimes such as those of South Africa, Rhodesia, and Israel. In this world they would be made operational nodes from which to identify and eliminate communist and dissident groups in their neighboring areas, coming to the conclusion that although these actions were morally compromising, it would be impractical to do otherwise, and these necessary evils are sure to be unpopular with the public, so for the sake of national security and the security of the world from communist expansion, these operations must remain clandestine. In theory, this would be much like the planned expansion of Operation Condor, which was a collaborative project with the dictatorships of South America to identify, suppress, and eliminate potential communist threats. West Germany, Britain, and France took a tremendous interest in this project and had considered implementing similar tactics in Western Europe. In this alternate world, they just might. Even if we were to assume the CIA were dealt a similar blow as it had been in the wake of the Watergate scandal, had these extended operations already been set in motion beforehand, it's very possible they could just re-manifest as an expanded safari club. The safari club being an organization which would come to be known as a quote, second CIA, formed from the joint intelligence agencies of France, Israel, South Africa, and Saudi Arabia to name a few, with the goal of taking up the US's anti-communist intelligence operations, while the American intelligence agency had its hands tied in legislation. This alternate world, at least up until this point, would be one in which the US was able to keep its secrets better hidden. The Vietnam War beyond geopolitics had a profound impact upon the American psyche. The American people, the nation's conscious, saw the dirty inner workings of warfare and turned away in disgust, no longer trusting its mind and body with the necessary evils and difficult decision making it once had. That isn't the case in this alternate world. The war is won just as the politicians said it would. And save for a scandal between political parties, the US would be on a positive rise, seeing relations with China and the Soviets improve while media focus moved away from international conflict to more domestic issues, allowing the Cold War to be fought quietly and out of view as the public carried on blissfully unaware. And that is where I'll end this video for now. The US of Z thanks you for watching, be sure to pick up a copy of our novel I Am Uncle Sam in the links below, support your legion by liking the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z. Out.